Welcome, good afternoon, uh, good morning, and good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, on behalf of the Department of Interpreting and Translation at the University of Bologna, and endorsed by the International Network TREK, I welcome you to the fourth lecture of the 2021 Food for Thought series devoted to cognitive translation and interpreting studies. I am Ricardo Muñoz, some of you know me. I cannot say hi to all friends that are in the list, uh, but I would like uh, if you allow me to say hi to Brigitta Englund Dimitrova because I have not seen her for a long time. Um, I would like to offer or use some housekeeping rules before we start. Remember that our lectures are split into two halves of some 20 minutes each, with five minutes in between, not seven, not three, about five minutes in between, to allow everybody to freshen up their attention a little bit. Please keep both mic and camera off. You may ask questions through the chat only, and through the whole event, although, uh, even though you can ask questions at any time, I will only forward them to our speaker by reading them out loud at the end of the second part. Please start your question whenever possible, if you don't forget, uh, by the way you would like to be addressed and your affiliation. For instance, Ricardo Muñoz, University of Bologna, Brigitte Engel Dimitrova, University of Stockholm. All right? Okay, um, uh, let's move on. Our um, topic today is not every translation decision is guided by logic. Emotions also play a part. A relatively new and definitely trending topic in our discipline. In today's talk, we will learn about the impact of emotions on all kinds of multilateral mediated communication tasks. So, not only translation, not only interpreting, everything. We will also learn that emotions entail a radical change in our views on rationality and the very nature of thought. Today's speaker uh, and friend is uh, Ana Maria Rojo Lopez. She is Professor of Translation Studies at the University of Murcia, Spain. And like the rest of our distinguished speakers, Professor Rojo is an affiliate of the MC2 lab and a member of the International Network Trek. Professor Rojo has authored and co-edited books on special issues such as Contrastive Cognitive Linguistics, Cognitive Linguistics from Words to Discourse, Diseños y Métodos de Investigación en Traducción, a book in Spanish on research methods and design in translation. Um, and now she has a book in press in John Benjamin's, which is Translation as an Emotional Phenomenon. Her current research interests focus mainly on the role of emotions, creativity, and other personality and individual differences in the translation process. She currently coordinates a research project on emotions and translation based on the study of translation and interpreting process through cortisol analysis, heart rate variability measurement, eye tracking, facial recognition, and reaction time analysis. So, as you can see, it is uh, it would be difficult to find somebody more adequate to talk about this topic to us today. So. I'm going to stop right here. Professor Rojo, thank you for being here with us today. Yours is the floor. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Let me see if I can um, share okay, my presentation. Can you see? Can you see what? Yes, yes perfect. Yes, thank you. okay. Well, welcome everyone. It's nice to see so many friendly faces and uh, thank you very much, Ricardo, for your nice introduction and for this opportunity to be here today as part of this wonderful initiative of the MC Lab. As you all know, um, the topic of my talk today is emotion and the role it plays in translation. 
even if not quite intentional, the title of my talk, Not Every Translation Decision is Guided by Logic, Emotions Also Play a Part, actually says a lot about this role. Since we usually tend to disprove what is generally believed or accepted as true. And the truth is that for a long time, emotion has had a secondary role compared to that of reason or logic. But fortunately, this is now changing quite rapidly. And my role here today is to show you how it is changing and, and convince you, so I hope, <laughs> of, the, of the prominent role of emotions. But let us start. How do I intend to accomplish such a challenge and structure my talk? Well, let me open with a spoiler. By presenting a research project on the role of emotion in translation, EMOTRA, led at the University of Murcia in Spain. This is the real aim of the talk. But before getting there, I will provide, provide you with some previous background knowledge. So I will start by addressing some of the key questions in emotion research, namely, why emotions are an interesting topic that deserve to be studied, which theory provides the background to our study, what is an emotion, and how can we measure it. Then I will present a research project, EMOTRA, its aims and the many different studies it comprises. Later, I will introduce some of our main findings and explanations, and I will finish with some future challenges. So let's, let's begin with the reasons. Why emotions? Most of us would probably agree, or so I hope as well, that emotions are a most fascinating topic of study because they're very basic and fundamental to our human being, and yet they're also highly contradictory with a light and a dark side. Emotions make us human. They are what differentiate us from robots, and they pervade every aspect of our lives from childhood to death. And yet, we commonly feel that despite our greatest efforts, they, can, they sort of escape our control. They can make us feel really good, but also really bad. They can foster and facilitate our professional career or make our work really hard. Most existing evidence focuses on the negative over the positive effects of emotions for translators and interpreters' mental health and performance. Among the positive effects, studies such as those of Caroline, Caroline Lea or Rojo and Ramos underline the benefits of positive emotions for cognitive flexibility and and those of negative emotions for analytic thinking and accuracy. Affective congruence has also been shown to lead to faster reaction times. As for negative effects, researchers, but also professionals now, have emphasized the, de the de detrimental consequences of emotions for mental health, with freelance, freelance translators frequently suffering from isolation, stress, or even imposter syndrome, a condition that refers to the feeling of believing you're not as competent as others perceive you to be, which translators, unfortunately, are increasingly reporting to experience in online blogs. Interpreters also very frequently suffer from stress and anxiety or even from vicarious trauma in context working with victims and sufferers. Vicarious trauma for those who may not know, refers to the indirect trauma that can occur when exposed to others' difficult, difficult or disturbing experiences. All these conditions are reported to have a negative impact on the quality of translators' and interpreters' performance. Please bear in mind that citations included here are, not, are only illustrative. Um, that there, there are many more studies on emotional aspects in translation and interpreting, but time and space do not allow me to mention all of them. So I apologize in advance to all those authors who are not mentioned here, but feel they should have been. And the question is why? Why can we not avoid the negative effects of emotions and keep our logical 
and emotional brain separated? Well, for the same reason that we don't we do not seem to manage to keep our professional and personal lives apart because our brain does not work work that way. Our brain is not a compartmentalized entity where emotions belong to a specific part of the brain that should be prevented from interacting or interfering with the other part. In contrast, recent evidence from neuroscience shows that the brain works as a whole where cognitive and cognitive and, and emotional functions are integrated. So, if we study cognition, emotion needs to be explored too, since they influence one another. But the question is, how do they interact and how are they integrated? Emotion has been shown to influence cognitive processes such as attention, executive control, or working memory. Evidence from psychology on the influence of emotion on attention shows that emotional cues can grab and modulate attention. In translation and interpreting studies, there is also evidence of the effect of emotional discourse on attention and even on the attentional response. For instance, a recent study by Lea and Feldblum shows that emotional balance plays a role in allocating cognitive resources and, atten and attention processes in translation. Positive balance seems to foster engagement with the source text and negative balance seems to foster allocation of cognitive resources to the target text. Related evidence from interpreting on the effect of emotional versus neutral stimuli shows that emotional discourse causes a stronger response, at least in terms of skin conductance, than neutral discourse. And the impact seems greater when interpreting into the L1, although no statistically significant results and effect were reported in the study by Korpa and Jan Koviak in press. As already mentioned, emotions have a long history of being detrimental to cognitive processes. For instance, evidence from psychology shows that distracting emotional cues may disrupt cognitive control and working memory. This result aligns with data from interpreting studies where stress has been widely reported to have a detrimental effect on interpreting performance. Similarly, in translation studies, stress and the time pressure conditions may affect translation quality, although only under certain conditions, and it may also influence translators' allocation of attention. Besides influencing our attention, memory, and control, emotion may also condition our cognitive behavior and performance. In fact, evidence from psychology shows that emotional states tend to promote mood congruent thoughts and actions. In translation, work such as that by Rojo and Ramos shows that translation reaction times are faster when the stimuli are congruent with their ideological beliefs. And emotional traits also play a role, influencing cognitive performance even when there is no emotional cue or trigger. This may explain results from translation and interpreting studies showing that some affect related personality traits such as emotional intelligence, emotional stability, openness to experience or resilience may play a role in predicting successful translation performance. Emotion certainly influences cognition, but cognition also influences and regulates emotion. Evidence from psychology shows that attention can help regulate an emotion. In this sense, the most basic strategy for reducing the distress is attentional avoidance, that is to simply avoid or look away from the source of distress. In translation and interpreting, this regulation may be achieved by increasing increased focused attention on the task being performed. This would explain why translation students would not give up under extreme uh, time pressure by keeping their attention focused on the task. And even why 
as Bush High and Craigie, Craigie, Craigie indicated, while some student interpreters may opt for an avoidance coping strategy, most students and professionals manage to overcome stress and anxiety using task-oriented coping. But the best proof of the integration between emotion and cognition is provided by neuroscience, where it has been demonstrated that emotion and control processes are integrated in different brain regions. A case of overlapping has been reported, for instance, between negative affect and cognitive control. Control processes are in fact engaged in a broader range of cognitive challenges associated with negative affect, as in when there is uncertainty about the optimal course of action, possibility of error, or competition between alternative courses of action. As you can imagine, this would certainly place emotions and particularly negative affect on a central stage in translation research where uncertainty, possibility of errors, and competing possibilities are the everyday task of translators. Once accepted that emotion is a part of cognition that needs to be studied as such, we will focus on how emotions are created. The truth is that despite their prevalence, emotions remain highly elusive to scientists. We believe that we can recognize emotions when we experience them ourselves and also when we see them in others. And yet, we all make mistakes when predicting others' emotional states, even those who are very close to us. We often think of emotions as events whose symptoms we can identify as a fingerprint, as seen in smiling when you are happy or frowning when being annoyed or angry. And yet, many people smile when, when, it, when, are sad, uh, when are sad or frown when are happy. The truth is that emotion remains most slippery with no unified consensus of a definition of emotion. This is what Lisa Feldman Barrett has labeled as the emotional paradox to call to our attention to the gap between the experience and the science of emotion. The paradox of emotion is that, on the one hand, they seem self-evident when and obvious when we examine them introspectively, but on the other hand, uh, they have been extremely difficult to define in objective scientific terms. The theory of constructed emotion poses that what exists in the brain and body is affect, and emotions are constructed by multiple brain networks working in tandem. The theory of constructed emotion refutes, in fact, locationist hypotheses of the brain, which assume that emotions such as um, fear, disgust, anger or, or sadness can be assigned to specific parts in the brain. In contrast, constructionist hypotheses pose that these areas are also involved in other processes and that what is found in all this is core affect that is construed as an emotion when made salient by executive attention and conceptualized as an instance of emotion. Feldman Parrot's example of how she conceptualizes an instance of sadness after some um, school shooting news illustrates very well the whole process. Let me read it to you. Sadness is something that may occur when certainly bodily feelings coincide with terrible loss. Using bits and pieces of past experience, such as my knowledge of shootings and my previous sadness about them, my brain rapidly predicted what my body should do to cope with such tragedy. Its predictions caused my thumping heart, my flushed face, and the knots in my stomach. They directed me to cry an action that would calm my nervous system, and they made the resulting sensations 
meaningful as an instance of stateless. So, taking this theory as our starting point, we will briefly revise the main parameters used to define emotions and the main processes involved in an emotional event. One of the problems with the definition of emotion is the conceptual fuzziness, since we have many different terms that are not always so easy to distinguish. For our purpose, we pose a continuum from non-salient, non-conscious core effect uh, to salient construed emotion, along which other terms can be also accommodated, such as salient affect, mood, or feeling. Please note that the positions along the continuum are only illustrative and do not intend to be accurate. And moreover, there are also, uh, these terms are also distinguished in the literature according to additional features such as duration or intensity, with mood and feeling being usually longer lasting but less intense than emotion. Affective states can also be defined according to two relevant features, balance or affective value, which ranges from positive to negative, and arousal or level, level of activation, which ranges from low to high. Uh, for instance, happiness and content have both positive balance, but happiness is high arousal and content is low. Anger and sadness, sadness have both a negative balance, but sadness is low arousal and anger is high. Let us now turn to the processes involved in the emotional event, which are then central in experimental research since they serve to define measurement. Most theorists would agree that emotions are complex events which involve different processes of responses. Here, we have an illustration of an anxiety. Generally, three types of processes are distinguished. Physiological, that is the physical reactions of our body, as in heart racing, trembling, and lack of, lack of appetite, and many others you can see on the screen. Uh, we also have the subjecti subjective experience of the emotion, which describes how we actually perceive it and evaluate its impact, and the behavioral, that is the actions that help us cope, as seen wanting to run away or smoking, eat, drinking, or eating compulsively. The main differences are actually found regarding what happens first and how many of these effects are necessary to define an emotional response. Is the physiological response enough? Or do we also need the subjective experience? Or what actually happens first? The physiological and behavioral effects or our subjective experience of them? Answers may indeed vary. In our project, answers, as you probably have guessed by now, follow the theory of constructed emotion and pose that emotional states are construed by multiple brain networks working together to make sense of salient effect in a given context. I am also rather confident that the process is already quite clear to you, but let me illustrate it again with a visual of how all these elements would be integrated into the construction of a specific instance of anxiety in the hope that we all go to the coffee break with a smile. Let us take the hypothetical, but here pertinent case of giving an online conference on emotion in translation. In such a hypothetical case, the speaker may start feeling probably previous uneasiness, distress, or even a sleep disturbance. All of them manifestations of affect that may become more salient as the date approaches. Most probably then, the speaker brain, based on her knowledge and previous experiences of conferences, maybe not so much online ones, will start to predict what to do to cope with the situation. These predictions, 
will make her heart probably palpitate, uh, maybe her hands and voice tremble, or maybe even an eye twitch. On the cognitive level, she may even start worrying about the slides quality, possible, possible problems with an internet connection, and most likely everything would direct her to want to run away and have a coffee instead, or anything that would calm her down. But uh, since this is not an option, she may well conceptualize this as an instance of a stage fear and being aware of her, of her capacity to manage the symptoms in previous situations, overcome her, her worry and continue with her presentation. Or so we hope, but it will have to be up to the break now. Can anyone hear me? Sorry? No, we, we lost you. Are you um, ready for the pause now? I can't I can listen. Hola. Hola. Okay, no, well, no, no. Um, uh, let me take control here. Uh, given that uh, we seem to have some technical problem, let's do the pause here for five minutes and we'll be back um, right afterwards. Okay, so see you in five minutes. Okay. All right, let's resume with our lecture of today. Um, uh, please remember that I will be taking the questions to the chat and that I will read them out loud later on uh, once Professor Rojo has finished her presentation. Uh, Professor Rojo, uh, you will see the floor again. Okay, thank you very much. Right, so let's go on. In this part, um, I will introduce EMOTRA, the research project on emotion in translation I have led for three and a half years at the University of Murcia. Let me begin with the general assumptions. Our research assumes that emotion involves physiological arousal, subjective feeling, and translation behavior reflected in both the production and reception of translated products. Please notice that when I say translation here, I use it in a general sense, since we also have done some research on interpreting and audio description. Uh, so we implement uh, measurement methods, including physiological indicators, measures, and translation performance assessment. As for the general aims of the project, the central aim of EMOTRA is to study the impact of emotion on the translation process and product from an interdisciplinary perspective that involves translation and psychology. This leads to two other aims. A more central one, um, aiming to define the effects of emotion with different valence on the process product and reception of translation. And a more secondary one aiming to explore the role of uh, individual traits and cultural differences. Finally, these aims will hopefully materialize in the design of a protocol to manage emotions, which will work as a deliverable for the professional and academic spheres. I'm not going to detail here all the specific aims of EMOTRA because of time restrictions since EMOTRA is in fact a very ambitious project that comp comprises many different studies. But let me start from the beginning. Everything started with four studies that planted the seeds for the project and that should be mentioned here. Ramos, PhD on the effect of different audio description styles on the reception of emotional film scenes. 
Rojo and Ramos uh, study on the effect of right, right versus left wing political beliefs on translators' reaction time. And two studies on the effect of positive versus negative feedback on the quality and creativity of translation. In these studies, we used heart rate, uh, reaction time, and self, self report measures. And we also explored the role of creativity and resilience as personality traits. EMOTRA now comprises 15 different st studies seven on written translation, two on audio description, two on interpreting, and four PhD theses. In all these studies, the following participants have granted their consent. 277 translation students, 23 interpreting students, 10 professional post editors, 95 uh, NGO professionals, that is professionals others than interpreters, working on, at non-governmental organizations, 35 uh, NGO professional interpreters, 180 professional translators, 362 consumers, and 84 visually impaired participants. In total, 1,066 participants we are most grateful to. Regarding the instruments for collecting and analyzing physiological and behavioral data, we have used the salivate uh, to analyze salivary cortisol, as you can see on the screen, it is a small tube that contains a cotton swab inside that must be placed um, in the mouth for a couple of minutes without chewing. Then uh, they, you have to freeze them at a very low temperature and later on the saliva samples are processed in a lab. We have also used um, a heart rate uh, wrist monitor, the one you can see on the screen, the Polar Vantage M, which together with the chest pan and a special soft software, uh, in this case the Cubius Premium, served to collect and analyze heart rate and heart rate variability. We have also used um, Open Sesame, a free software to collect and analyze reaction time, and Face Reader to collect and analyze facial expressions. We have also used the Pratt Acoustic Voice Analysis Program for interpreting and a night tracker for one of the PhDs. Although in this case, it is not the one on the screen, which was acquired later on. At the time, we borrowed a night tracker from Copenhagen, and I would like to take a minute here to thank um, Art Jacobsen and Christian Felpum for the generosity lending us the eye tracker we used. And finally, as for self-report data, we have used um, different tests depending on the affective state or personality trait measured. We have used, for example, the STI test for trait and state anxiety, the STAXI, which is the equivalent for anger, the panels for positive and negative effect, the self-assessment mannequin scale, the scale for sexual uh, inhibition and activation, the transport narrative questionnaire to measure narrative engagement, the Rosenberg test to measure self-esteem, and some tailor-made questionnaires to measure relevant features or even some specific emotions. Okay, since um, there is no time to explain here all the, the studies in detail, and since I have already explained to you and introduced the, the instruments and measures we've used, what I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly summarize the research questions of the different studies to give you a general idea of what we have done. Then later, if you have any more specific question about any of these studies, I can answer them uh, during the questions. Uh, many members of my team are also here today to assist, so we will all be happy to uh, attempt to answer any doubt. 
Right. Regarding the studies on emotion, we have the study by Rojo and Naranjo and Rojo, sorry, published last year in Target, which focuses on the effect of emotional congruence uh, or incongruence between happy and sad music and happy and sad text. The one uh, by Rohan Meseguer, which will be shortly published in a special issue of On Emotions We Are Preparing for Onomatheine, also researches the effects of uh, emotional congruence or incongruence between headlines from Catalonia's independence and student translators' uh, ideological beliefs. This study uses reaction time, but a similar one in preparation recorded facial expressions. Another study uh, recently published in the Journal of Pragmatics this year explores the effects of a positive versus negative framing of the COVID-19 crisis on the translation strategies used. And a similar one in preparation uh, now replaces the COVID-19 for a negative stereotype of Spain versus a neutral version. There are also two studies on written translation that are now in preparation and that explore the effects of time pressure on anxiety and translation quality. One uses cortisol and the other one explores the regulatory role of self-esteem. As for interpreting, there are two studies on the effect of stress on a, on a speech performance that use the Pratt voice analysis program. But one focuses, the one uh, in press in perspective, focuses on rhythm parameters, and the one in preparation uh, focuses on pauses. And there are also two studies on audio description that explore whether audio described porn produces a similar impact to that of audiovisual porn. But the one now in Press in Frontiers in Psychology, which will be shortly released, uses cortisol and heart rate. And the one uh, which will be published also in the Onomathein issue on emotion only uses a heart rate and one experimental group less. And finally, we have the four PhD thesis within the project on different emotion related topics. Uh, we have the, the one by Kasia Novak, uh, who explores the effects of non-translation, that is basically the use of English, on consumers' attitudes and preferences in Spanish versus Polish advertising. Inma García Vicente's work uses eye tracking to explore how expectations about machine translation quality may affect post-editing work. Alba García Pedeño's PhD explores the role of emotions in NGO interpreting. And the one by Rosana Esquinas, this is the latest, uh, focuses on audiobooks and explores the effects of the auditory mood, mode sorry, on the translation of emotional content. Okay, to finish with the presentation of Imotra, I will try to summarize some of the findings of our project in relation to previous results in translation and interpreting and some relevant concepts and hypotheses from psychology. Okay. In line with previous results from Caroline Lea and Rojo and Ramos' previous studies, our data provide support for the broadened hypothesis. The pose is that Positive emotions broaden the scope of attention and support creative thinking, while negative emotions narrow the scope of attention and support analytic thinking. Our results show that emotional balance influences translation behavior. Positive emotion leads to more creative translation solutions, but not necessarily less errors probably because they diminish motivation for uh, costly processing. In contrast, negative emotions may lead to more accurate translations and less spelling and grammatical mistakes, 
acting probably as motivators to correct behavior. In line with previous results from Rojo and Ramos, our work on political ideology supports the hot cognition hypothesis in this field that poses that sociopolitical concepts previously evaluated are effectively charged and that this affective charge is automatically activated faster than conscious uprising. Our data on the Catalonian conflict reveal that the affective charge of political concepts can influence a student translator's reaction time. Our data show that ideologically congruent stimuli slowed a student translator's reaction time down during the comprehension of the source text, but speeded it up when making a final decision to select an equivalent. The facilitating effect of congruency uh, when translating supports the hot cognition hypothesis, but it does not explain why they took longer when reading the source text. A plausible explanation is that congruent stimuli may have been more arousing and felt of higher relevance, attracting more attentional resources. Moreover, our results on being slower reading but faster choosing a translation align with existing data from, horiz from horizontal theories of translation, which argue that translation options start to be considered when reading the source text. Results from previous work by Naranjo on the effects of affective congruence between music and text suggests that affective congruence facilitates translation performance. Our data reveal that congruence between music and text leads to more creative translations, and that the increase in creativity may be mediated by higher levels of empathy under the musical congruence condition. This result aligns with previous evidence from film studies on the positive effect of congruence between music and stimuli in facilitating decision-making, increasing the focus of attention, and fostering greater empathy with the story. Empathy is related to the notion of narrative engagement. That poses that the extent to which one becomes engaged, transported, or immersed in a narrative influences its potential to affect subsequent story-related attitudes. In line with uh, Fryer and Freeman's previous work, our studies in our studies, uh, uh, narrative engagement has been used to measure whether audio description can guarantee visually impaired participants, a similar experience to that provided uh, to sighted participants by the audiovisual product. Our studies on porn show that audio described porn provides a similar experience to audiovisual porn in terms of both physiological reactivity and subjective sexual arousal and narrative engagement, showing that auditory input can be as effective as audiovisual input in, fost in fostering narrative and emotional engagement. Sorry. Our work on interpreting and that on time pressure in translation provide evidence on the system of a number of factors that modulate the effects of the so-called inverted U theory that poses that peak performance is achieved when the level of stress experienced is appropriate for the task undertaken. In line with previous data, our results show that increased stress responses do not always have a detrimental effect on performance, and that there are other factors modulating the effects. In our work on interpreting, for instance, higher level of stress were only significantly correlated with more errors and alterations in a student's rhythm of a speech when interpreting into the L2 as compared to interpreting into the L1. 
Similarly, in our work on time pressure in translation, high stress correlated with a lower number of translated words, but not necessarily more mistakes. Probably the increased attention served to control for mistakes. In fact, our analysis pointed to the role of attentional control, since uh, our data revealed a decrease in cortisol, possibly reflecting an attentional response. Our work on interpreting suggests that uh, L2 proficiency plays a role in mediating the effects of stress on interpreting performance, uh, a result that aligns with those of Tiselius and Dimitrova and also Melinger and Gasca Jimenez. Our work on time pressure points to the role of personality in translation, in line with the studies by Bontempo and Napier in sign language interpreting, or Hirsha Davison, Le Capor, or Abisira in translation. Our results also align with data from psychology, pointing to the regulatory role of personality traits on emotion. Our data revealed that self-esteem modulates the effects of time pressure on translation quality. Participants with higher level of self-esteem translated more words, but made more mistakes under the effect of time pressure. Those participants uh, with lower levels of self-esteem translated less words, but made less mistakes. Also, high trade anxiety levels emerged as predictors of lower number of translated words under time pressure. And finally, many of our studies point to the effect of focal task engagement, that is the ability to focus and engage with the task on modulating emotional effects. A result that somehow aligns with Rohan Alarcon's data on the relevance of concentration for translation. Uh, work on the effects of a positive versus a negative um, framing of the, of the COVID-19 crisis suggests that the framing may influence translators' affectivity and strategic behavior. With negative affectivity being higher after the negative framing and lower after the positive one. And the students modified the evaluative content, content of the negative version to a higher degree than that of the positive version. Moreover, the impact of, uh, on a student's affective, affective levels was higher after reading the source text than after translating it. It seems that the emotional impact decreases or decreased at that time as student translators engaged more into the task to maintain a desirable level of performance, suggesting that the attentional response caused by increased focal, focal task engagement may serve as an emotion regulation strategy. And finally, this time is finally, I would like to close this presentation with some food for thought, pointing to five challenges relevant for the future of emotion research. Um, please bear in mind that they are not the only ones and may not even be the most relevant ones either, but they will hopefully give us some reasons to stop and reflect uh, on present needs. The first challenge relates to translation assessment methods. Since we need more precision and, un and uniformity in defining performance measures and scoring parameters. Also, in order to make results more comparable across different studies, we need greater transparency and more open access repositories to make parameters and materials available. The second challenge relates to the experimental procedure. We need to develop and validate stimuli and protocols for eliciting and measuring different emotions. We need emotionally laden source texts and discourses that are comparable for translation difficulty. We need video clips validated for emotions of different balance and activation, and even stimuli with different audio description styles. 
The third uh, challenge points to the wise use of technology and statistics. There is no point in using um, instrumentation or statistics just for the sake of more fancy studies. We need to know what instruments are valid for what measures. Likewise, statistics is a very useful tool, and certainly the study of emotion as part of human cognition and behavior calls for more dynamic methods beyond uh, linear statistics and static models. But we also need to know what types of analysis are most appropriate considering our sample size and type of variables. We definitely need to increase our sample size sizes if we want to make statistical analysis worthwhile. The fourth challenge um, refers to the bias of the experimental setting. When working with emotions, it is very important to try to minimize the deterrent effect of the experimental situation, such as the anxiety to the unknown or to instrumentation. One way to reduce uh, experimental bias would be to foster ways to obtain more measures of behavior in the real world, uh, maybe with online experimentation platforms that allow us to collect data from the comfort of participants on home. And finally, even if ethical procedures have been much strengthened, we still need to maximize ethical care in emotion research. When researching emotions, a tricky issue is that of avoiding bias without compromising participants' well-being. Oh, sorry about that. We may not be able to inform our participants of our specific aim, but we have the moral duty of uh, telling them the general aim and explaining any possible risk in the protocol. We also need more diversified protocols adapted to participants' special needs. And now, very quickly, let me just uh, finish by introducing the members of the EMOTRA, EMOTRA team and expressing my gratitude to all of them for their work and compromise with the project. As you can see, we are an interdisciplinary team made by translators and psychologists. Uh, we also have a majority of women, which was not intentional at all, but anyway, we're most proud, proud of, without forgetting our few men, of course. And this is all. Uh, my most sincere and emotional thank, thank you to all of you, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rojo. This was a fascinating lecture. People are also tweeting away, you will be glad to know. I will now read uh, the questions that the audience may pose. So far, uh, we have had one, uh, actually, uh, one request whether you can provide a list of uh, references, relevant references, I imagine related to your project. Okay, I don't have them here, but I can, I can, I can sort of do it and, and perhaps pass it to you, Ricardo, and, and distribute yes. it. Or yes. Okay. Yes. So we have a so reference. I should have included the references at the at the end of the presentation. Okay. Now uh, I was glad to see that the challenges that you are uh, seeing for the future are not different in emotion research as in other parts of cognitive innovation and interpreting studies. Standards, rigor, and use of um, tools to analyze data. Um, but I am particularly interested uh, to ask you about the effect of um, the experimental environment and the white for code effects in emotion research, which might be especially prominent. You, sorry, you, you asking me about the, the effects in, of the experimental setting, no? Yes, I am. Okay, yeah, well, that, that is one of the major problems we found with many of our studies, because what happens when you work with um, physiological measures, um, when participants go to the experimental setting, 
uh, of course, even if, even even if students work at the university and it's in a familiar environment, there is something uh, I don't know that very insecure about. Like let's take the example with the phone. Okay, I can hear somebody speaking. Can you not? Uh, if we if we consider the, the study where we measure porn, what happened is, and we had visually impaired participants as well. Uh, when participants get there to the to a strange environment, their levels we measure always at the beginning. We measure their reactivity, uh, heart rate or cortisol, and what happens is that it's very very high the level. That is because of the environmental anxiety. And that sometimes is an obstacle to uh, find the, the effect you expect to, to get afterwards. So we need to minimize that. And I reckon a, a very um, excellent way would be to be able to collect data, you know, to, to allow them to perform the experiments in the comfort of, of their own home. I don't know if I'm answered your question, Ricardo. I, I can't hear anything. It was my fault. Um, oh, I can't hear you. I couldn't hear you at all. Can, can you hear me now? Hang on. Can you speak now? Yes, I can. Okay. Can you hear me? Now. Yeah, now I can. Yeah. Okay. So I am waiting for questions, but there do not seem to be any. So let us wait for some uh, moments. Okay, I think I'm going to stop using my AirPods because I think they're, they're giving me some. Um, can you hear me properly without the AirPods? Perfect. Yeah. All right, there do not seem to be any questions. I guess that uh, uh, they can locate you and write to you an email in case uh, somebody was shy or late in thinking what they wanted to ask. Thank you very much. It was a fascinating later, uh, uh, lecture. People are, as I told you, tweeting away. And uh, um, um, we are now in the need of putting an, an end to the event, since some people will have to attend or teach a class at two. So there, Professor Rojo, thank you very much again for your very informative lecture. Uh, we are certainly lucky to have you as a member of the MC2 lab. To the audience, don't go away just yet. I have several announcements and reminders, okay? So let us uh, bid farewell to Professor Rojo and stay with me, audience, please. Um, okay, let's see. First... I would like to tell you that our next lecture will be on April 15, when Professor Sanjun from Beijing Foreign Studies University and also an NCLAB affiliate and a track member will talk about the cognitive aspects of the interpreting tasks in a lecture with the title Text Complexity and the Translation Difficulty. Same time, same day, April 15, please save the date. Second, I would like to tell you that all previous lectures in the series can now be accessed in our YouTube channel, which can be accessed also through our MC Labs website. Third, there are not only ones, we are not the only ones organizing lectures on cognitive translation and interpreting studies. Uh, I just saw us in the audience the Professor Ben, uh, 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 Bing Han Zeng from uh, Durham University, uh, who just started their own lecture series. Kent State University is offering also the series Crete Translation Colloquium, and some of our attendees, one of our attendees, will be talking tomorrow in then, uh, and it is also open. It is Professor Hannah Risku from University of Vienna, who will talk about rethinking translation expertise, a workplace perspective. That will be, excuse me, that will be 
um, um, 10 a.m. in Eastern Daylight and Daylight Time in the United States. I still have one more uh, note. Many governments uh, will not let us uh, travel easily in these times and our university, like many others, prefer scholars not to organize face-to-face -face events in the next months. As a species, we humans have survived other pandemics far worse than this one. And we not only survive, but we also seize the opportunity to make a somewhat better world. So it is with this spirit that we have now decided, and with these conditions, that we have now decided to shift the uh, International Conference of Translation, Interpreting and Cognition to November. So it will take place from November the 2nd, Tuesday, to November the 5th, Friday. We had to add one day, so now it is four days, because we received 140 abstracts and the referees have accepted about 100 of them. So this will make the ICT3 uh, conference the largest conference on cognitive translation and interpreting studies ever. The dates were chosen to avoid clashes with other major conferences you may wish to attend. And we are sorry, no date can accommodate everyone. So we apologize for that. On the other hand, some people may have sent their work might have sent their work if they had known it uh, was in November. So we will open a second round for paper and poster submission from April 5 to April 11. In contrast, our uh, first international uh, summer school on cognitive translation and interpreting studies will stay in June and go online. The school is organized by our lab on behalf of both the Department of Interpreting and Translation of the University of Bologna and the Institute of Translation and Interpreting of the Zurich University of Applied Sciences. And it is endorsed by the European Society for Translation Studies and the International Research Network, TREC. The school will take place between June 14 and 25. Applications will be welcome between April 12th and April 30. In order to apply, you need to fill out the online form at the website, at uh, the website of the school, and also attach a 700 to 1000 word long statement of purpose explaining what your research aims and goals are. We will make our best to make sure that the school is nearly as enticing and inspiring as it was going to be face to face. You may write to us or visit our uh, summer schools website, which we are still updating. You will be happy to know that we have lowered the tuition fees, which will now include free registration to the ICTIC3 conference. So those who come to, to attend the summer school will be able to come in November and register and attend the conference for free. Uh, you have here the list of the impressive faculty that, and myself that, that uh, um, uh, agreed to uh, uh, contribute to this summer school. And uh, on that note, uh, let me thank you all very much for having shared this time with us and wish you a great weekend wherever in the world you are now. Good afternoon.